Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and as my table's resident rogue main, I've been looking at Alessandra a lot lately. Because I know that in our first campaign, my teammates aren't going to be playing a blessed build, they just aren't, they aren't into that shit. So that rules out Kohaku for us. I think one of my people will definitely be playing Hank, and of the other two new characters, I don't think anyone's super interested in either Kate or Wilson Richards. But as our table's resident rogue main, I look at Alessandra and I'm like, yeah, this is a rogue that actually works. She has a stat line that does things and an ability that says you may take an additional action. She's obviously going to be good. The real question is how good is she going to be? Because her ability does specify she has to play a weird parlay gimmick deck. Her star is, you know, literally irrelevant to everything. The main thing I see this star doing is saving you the necessary exhaust action on power word sometimes if you hit it during the mythos phase. Like it may as well be blank, let's be honest. But her deck building does give her literally every parlay card in the game and rogue zero to five with no weird restrictions. And she gets her signature three times, which is usually a pretty good thing. Coming from a two side signature, it's a two cost event, Beguile, it's fast, you play it during your turn, attach it to a non-elite enemy. That enemy will then gain a parlay action, which obviously for Alessandra can be a free action once around. And it lets you move them, which isn't great, or evade at its location, which isn't great. But the big one is perform a basic investigate, allowing you to use fine clothes as a permanent plus two book and investigate as a free action, which is really, really solid. This does mean you have to manage that enemy by finding a way to keep it exhausted, but that's not the hardest puzzle in the world, although at that, that level zero, it definitely is a serious puzzle. And of course, if you fail, you lose the Beguile, so it's not just permanent, but you should be pretty good at passing this check. You will still auto fail sometimes with Curse Cascade, but this is a pretty solid way of turning your ability to parlay into valuable forward regression in the form of clues. As for Zamakona, it's a 3-3-3 enemy with Elusive, and again, I just haven't fully grokked how Elusive is going to play, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Spawn nearest empty location of Able, Alessandra cannot parlay with this enemy, and force the first time you parlay, place one duo on this enemy. Basically, either you tell your fighter, hey, go kill that guy, or you backstab them. That's how I see this. It's either going to be attacks on the fighter, or you're going to run backstab for this guy. And the unfortunate thing here is as far as killing this guy goes, backstab's kind of the only super efficient way to do it. Like the main thing is this last bit of line, it's a three health enemy with elusive that places a doom when parlays happen. That's a huge problem. Like it does have to get dealt with immediately and it's probably gonna seriously muck around your fighter because even as a flex, I don't see Alessandra dealing with this super efficiently unless she gets a backstab. And if she does happen to draw a backstab before this and land the backstab, it's not a problem but it will cost you resources, a card, a deck slot. And what's worse is it won't always work. Sometimes you'll draw auto fail. Sometimes you'll just draw a curse cascade because your foot's not that good. Like baseline backstab is four to three. You need help to make that work. So this is a fairly threatening weakness, but I think odds are it just becomes a problem for your fighter. And your fighter's like, man, I wish you were playing someone else. But as far as you're concerned, it's Alessandra. This is not the worst thing in the world. Before we start talking about Alessandra and what kind of deck I think you should build for, I just want to look at all the cards available to Alessandra. And this is all the parlay shit in the game, at least as far as Arkham DB is concerned, assuming I haven't missed anything. Now let's get started by knocking out some bad cards that really don't deserve a spot here. First of all, Dirty Fighting is an incredible card, but for Alessandra, not so much. I did not remember it gave plus two to parlay on exhausted enemies, but you still need to exhaust them and you can't reaction parlay, only reaction fight. So I have a hard time seeing this making the cut unless there's a really jank fighter flex Alessandra or you're actually fighting with Fist, but I just do not see that happening. Next up, we have cards like False Surrender. We're using a parlay to try to play a weapon cheaper. And again, I don't see Fist Alessandra working with a base two Fist. And in that exact same vein, we have Hold Up. I just don't see any parlays that test Fist actually working Alessandra, especially when it's just for like playing an asset or dealing damage traditionally. I don't think that's a thing Alessandra's looking for. And while Interrogate absolutely does stuff that Alessandra is looking for, it gets two clues. The issue is that it's going to be a minimum of a four fist test, which fine clothes will bring down to two, but that's still a two to two test on a one fist enemy, which most enemies will be harder. Like if you're using this and well-dressed to get through a test, it's not very good. I don't see that making the cut. Motivational speech is great economy, but if you don't have a ton of allies, then it's not gonna be great for you. So it's more of a support Alessandra thing because I don't see Alessandra wanting very many allies. The decks I built, I have an incredibly hard time getting down to 30 cards with only one ally. I do not see motivational speech actually fitting into Alessandra decks, unfortunately. Blackmail Files, a new two cost zero experience card. It lets you parlay a non-elite for head X where X is the printed health value. 
and we succeed, it disengages, becomes aloof, and doesn't touch anyone for the rest of the round. And that's cool, because realistically, there are a lot of two-fisted lower enemies where this just says spin in action, they don't exist. But if I'm using Alessandra's ability to turn off one enemy and do nothing of value, like, that's not actually very good, this doesn't feel good to me at all. This feels very jank, very not worth running, and I'm not interested in Blackmail File. I look at this, and I think if I made a deck of 30 cards like this, my deck wouldn't do anything. We also have Persuasion. You test book three against a, I believe it's been taboo to not be, oh, it's not tabooed. It's still a specifically humanoid enemy. Well, that's basically why you're not running this, but it gets plus X difficulty for X, the horror value. So you're expecting this to be like three to five, usually three or four. And if you succeed, you shuffle it and do the encounter deck. And if it's elite, you evade it. It's just not a very strong effect, not worth considering. Like we have 24 cards in the pool of cards where this is just the stuff we're really seriously looking at. We can't afford to be looking at okay effects. I'm going to go ahead and remove one of the vamps. I'll remove the level zero vamp, which is a three test for one of these effects. The level three vamp is much better at a two test, so auto succeed with fine clothes for all of the effects. The effects are still the same, but doing all of them is way better than doing one of them. And then we have to look at one more card to remove from this pile, which is going to be confound. Confound costs 3D experience. That's the problem with it. A book X where X is the enemy's evade value with fine clothes, not going to be super problematic. It's probably going to be four to one, four to two in the worst case scenario. If you succeed, you get two clues. If it is a non-elite enemy, you evade it and it doesn't ready. So it's a super evade. Like this is a strong effect, but when we come over to my future Alessandra plans, you'll see why I'm not really seriously considering Confound because it's very hard to get down to 30 cards. It's very hard to trim the experience down from all the stuff you want because Power Word here is 100% going to be a 10 experience card. You need all of this shit. Specifically, you need Thrice Spoken and Tongue Twister, because if you're doing a Power Word head check, because it's been tabooed, it is a head check now. Let's get that on. If you're doing a head three test, you don't want to, like, exhaust one enemy, right? You don't want to tell one enemy to exhaust. You want to tell three enemies to exhaust, and while you're at it, could you also, like, get three clues, or heal us for two damage and one horror, or kill a guy, or trip a guy, right? Like, you want all of those ticked. So that no matter what location you're at, whatever mythos cards you draw, you'll be able to find a way to get value. And then Power Words essentially is turning off three enemies and dragging them around with you for all your other cards as well. And getting you healing and damage and evasion and clues. And clues is the big one there. Healing is the second big one. I don't trust this card to be good at fighting or evading. But if it has an option to do something for everything, then every turn, you're probably going to hit something with them, right? Oh, and as you get uh, Thrice Spoken, you get a third copy of it. So you can see that just like looking at the baseline, we have Vamp and Power Word, and that's already 16 experience. We've also got two experience coming from Access Control Riddle. The Riddle is not a bad card. If you put it on a Hunter, there's just an enemy with you forever because this is gonna be a six minus hand size book test, which is like very frequently four to one or zero. Like it does, it's not hard to beat this test. But the issue is that even if you have somebody just following you as an aloof Hunter doing nothing with Existential Riddle, you kind of already want to run a ton of draw to find your fine clothes, to find your power words, and your power words already keep a guy with you and do stuff at the same time, so it's not like you needed to have this in play. I view Existential Riddle as being strictly redundant with power word and the way you're planning on building Alessandra already, so even though it seems really good in her, I'm not going to count this as like the core pile of stuff I'm really looking at. That would be this. These are the cards in Alessandra where I look at them and think, all right, we have something going on here. But I'm going to add an honorary card to this list. It's not a parlay in and of itself. But if your whole deck is built around finding and parlaying a specific enemy, being able to dig through the deck for an enemy is kind of important. Additionally, it's economy. It finds a clue. Like, it's hard to look at Alessandra and not think kicking the hornet's nest is a core card on her. Not because it's insane power in and of itself. It never has been. Even in characters like Trish and Finn, it's just good. What Kicking the Hornet's Nest does is allows us to more consistently enable our parlay effects right off the bat. It helps smooth out those games where you draw no enemies for the first four turns. This is seemingly a really important card, especially if you're going towards big money and need the resource generation it's offering. I think this is the core pile of stuff for Alessandra that we've seen so far that I'm really interested in. And to go through the ones I haven't shown at all so far, String of Curses is a very good event. You choose a non-elite enemy for one cost event. You either auto evade it, give it a doom, and discover a clue, but you can't kill it for the rest of the round. Or, if that enemy has one or more doom, you just kill it instantly and get a resource for each doom. So it either insta kills an acolyte for a free action, or it gets a clue and temporarily deals with an enemy, provided you can manage the doom next turn. It's just a very nice, efficient card. Drain Essence is in a similar boat. It's like Spectral Razor, the parlay version. Two cost parlay, you test had X, where X is the enemy's fight value. If you succeed, you move 
one damage to the chosen enemy, two if it's not elite. So you always want to do this on a non elite enemy, on an actual boss enemy. This is a terrible action. But against non elite enemies, it's a nice way to heal yourself. It's a nice way to deal damage. Grift is a foot zero test. You get resources equal to what you succeed by, maximum six. But if you fail, the enemy attacks you. So, you know, just like a good one in 16 that you randomly get slapped for no reason instead of making money. Always fun. But on the whole, it is still a parlay event that gives you economy and worth considering once you start looking at big money stuff for the character. I can't believe you missed Snitch. This is the huge thing pushing Alessandra. It is a one cost event. It's fast. You play it after you succeed at a parlay. You discover two clues from amongst your location and connecting locations. This is Parlay Shadow Light. That's all it is, which is very, very good. And it is in and of itself enough reason to run Eldritch Tongue. But there are other events. You might need to get a Beguile back. You might need to get a Grift or a Drain Essence or even just like a vamp, right? There's enough stuff here for Eldritch Tongue to be curved that once you add Shadow Light to the mix, this is worth putting in the deck. The big questionable one for me is fake credentials. Because yes, this will essentially let you do one really effective book test every round for about four or five rounds before it starts not actually helping you. But my issue with it is if I'm using this for my Alessandra value, like later on, I'm just using power word for Alessandra value. I'm not, I don't even need fake credentials. I'm already using my Alessandra to get clues. I need to be able to do stuff with my other actions, not just one of them. So for the same reason, I typically don't like lockpicks. I don't really like fake credentials because if I'm triggering Alessandra on power word or beguile, then what is fake credentials doing? It's a book boost and not a reliable or cheap book boost, just a book boost. And I genuinely don't think fake credentials makes the cut. And that is something I realized after like over an hour of theory crafting Alessandra decks is I was like, wait a second, why am I running this card? What does it actually do? And it's about the same point in time I realized kicking the Horde Nest was probably poor. So let's go start looking at the decks that I've actually constructed from this shell. And let's start at the end of the story, not the beginning. This is the character I'm looking at right now where I think she probably goes big money. And it's technically a flex deck because once you make a deck with power word designed around drawing power word, you know, you probably just manage three enemies permanently. You're helping with fighting in a meaningful way. And you have a vamp, which is going to be deal two damage and evade the boss. So like you're doing enough that you are definitely not just pure Kluver. You are meaningfully helping with enemies. And this deck could be tilted a lot more towards flexing. And that's sort of the gist of where I'm at. I'm trying to figure out where Alessandra's home really is. And the reason that I think she goes big money is Gios is plus one to head. Black Band is plus one to head. That gets us to base five head. You'll notice Dario's here. I really care about the head, the head number. And the reason is because Power Word has been tabooed to be a three head test. Because of this test, even with fine close up, it's three to one as a baseline, right? You're not actually beating a minus three. Why is that so important? There are lots of scenarios where squid is like a minus three or minus four. If you fail, place a doom. You need to do this every turn on your power word. So I'm of the opinion that you really, really need to have a baseline four or five head for this character to work well with power word. And as I was looking at all the ways to do that, the black fan is just, if I need head, there's no other card offering as much as this alongside the head pump. Not with this card pool, not with rogue zero to five. Gias is in the same boat, although the big reason to go for Gias, as always happens with big money decks, is not that it's better than skills. What like five cards am I cutting to put in guts and other skills, right? Like Gias isn't here because it's better than the alternatives. It costs less cards than the alternatives. And looking at this, I'm not sure where the economy balance is at because like the Guile and Power Word Shield cost a lot, but I'm running Kicking the Hornet's Nest, Hot Street, Grift, Falsy and Bargain, Easy Mark. It's probably too much. But if it is, Fausti and Bargain my teammates now, like it's not a terrible thing. So the real question I'm at right with this deck is, if I just build a deck that plays Power Word, Snitch, and has five actions with six book, seven book because of Dario, is that good enough? And yeah, probably. I look at this and I don't think it's the like coolest, hottest build of Alessandra, but I think big money gives her the thing she wants, which is reliably triggering the tabooed Power Word. Coming over to the version I had of this where I realized, oh shit, yeah, Power Word is a test. What is that again? Oh no, it's a three head test. There's so much text on this card. It's absolutely comical. <laughs> anyway, when I was looking at this deck, I realized like, oh no, my plan is to do a three to one test every turn. I'm gonna lose so many actions to pulling bad tokens. I'm going to have situations where I can't pull the bag at all. And like, I don't look at a deck and see these skills and think it's good generally. I know my favorite deck in the game runs all of these as well, but Flexmark here against the exception, not the rule. 
So like you can absolutely run stuff like lock picks with Lucky Cigarette Case 3 to try to more effectively dig through your deck and you have great lock picks numbers. With the Lotus Santiago, you can turn all that same economy into clue finding. There's cool hot shit you can do outside of going big money, but it makes this card a lot worse. And I feel like this card is the core of an Alessandra deck. Which brings me to level zero Alessandra, where I'm really worried about how the character fits into a team. Because with both of these high level versions, they're really built around power word. It's probably the first thing I'm buying after scenario one is some baseline power word with tongue twister and other shit. Like it just needs to get online immediately. And it's probably the most important card to buy even above snitch. However, when you look at these decks, because of power word, they're helping on enemies a lot. Once you get vamp, you're helping on enemies quite a lot. But back at level zero, this deck does not help with enemies. It runs breaking and entering because I'm going to need to kick the hornet's nest to get an enemy on turn one or two. Then I need to trip them so they don't beat me up so I can use Beguile for two turns instead of one. Because this doesn't exhaust, I can repeatedly investigate. But like, I can't evade the enemy forever. If I'm just evading enemies to keep my thing going, first of all, I'm only at four foot. It's probably not going to work. But second of all, it just... It's not efficient. If I evade every turn, then this free action was worthless. I could have just had to fight or kill the guy, right? So at level zero, this is pretty much a pure clooper. It's not even really technically flex yet. And that's the big thing I'm currently grappling with when it comes to building Alessandra is I can put stuff like Drain Essence in this deck. I can do it in the later decks too, but what on earth do I cut here for it? Probably Hot Streak. You say this economy is not necessary and you put that in. Let's give that a shot. The deck certainly looks better with Drain Essence. It feels safer with her bad health soak. It's not even true, isn't she 7-7? Seven, seven? In my heart, she's Safina, but that's not true. Yeah, she's 7-7. Seven, seven. My gut says that Drain Essence costs two, and that's a pretty big economy swing. <laughs> yeah, I, the last thing this deck needs is more events that cost too much money, I'm sorry. And that's sort of happening here too, right? If I try to put in stuff like Drain Essence, realistically what I'm doing to make it happen is cutting Pilfer, because I don't have the money to be casting Drain Essence and eventually Pilfer too. That doesn't seem feasible to me. And that's sort of where I am with Alessandra right now. There are two problems we're trying to solve with the character. One is how do I contribute at level zero in the flex capacity the way the higher level decks do? And two, how do I actually draw these damn fine clothes? Like I've got easy marks, obviously. I've got lucky cigarette case. Are there other cards like other than the neutral draw skills? Because that's one of the pulls towards this deck is that it seems like it's better at drawing. Whereas with big money, it's like, you know, you used haste and draw, draw, haste to draw. That's my draw strategy. That's what I've got. It seems very hard to find fine clothes in mono rogue. And I'm trying to work out that puzzle as well as making my role more consistent from beginning to end. Anyway, that's gonna be all for now. This isn't a video about how you should play Alessandra. It's more a video about how I approach deck building. How originally the problem I was trying to solve is just how do I make this good? How do I get this additional action every turn? And the answer was definitely power word. This is the strongest thing you're doing for a recursive parlay action. But then you realize like, yeah, you can build this deck, but power word is a three head test now. How do you pass that? Is it big money? Is that the best answer? Is big money the best draw because of haste and your extra actions? Or should I be going for something more like this to more reliably find fine clothes in the first place? So I need that. And either way, both of these are flexing way harder than this deck. Is that okay? I think the reason I want to show this video is to show like, if you're struggling with a character, if you don't know what you should do next, if you keep encountering a different puzzle and a different problem, that's probably normal. That's how learning a new character works. That's what optimizing is. There are very few characters where you sit down and think, oh, this is the best thing I can do. I'm done. Even with a strong character like Rex, there's so many options in front of you that it's not immediately obvious what the best thing you can do is. And with characters who aren't at that top tier of power, trying to get them close as they can be to it's actually really difficult. And if you ever tried to optimize Joe, like the reason Joe's fun to think about is because every time you do anything in Joe, it creates a different problem for you. With Alessandra, I think this problem is solvable, but I just haven't figured it out yet. Anyways, I'm rambling in circles. I'm done for now. Thank you for listening. I've been rather coherent. I hope you're as hyped on the new investigators as I am. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, Evan and Jeffrey B as well, and I'll see you in the next one.